Hey everyone, Bill Barhite here. Welcome to the Abra Money 3.0 show where I talk about the future of money and technology. This episode is an edited audio version of a recently recorded Money Talks Live AMA. There's also a video version of this podcast available on youtube.com slash Abra Global. Again, that's youtube.com slash Abra Global. The information presented in this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any of the financial assets discussed. Neither Abra nor any of the participants in this podcast make any representation as to the suitability or appropriateness of these financial assets for individual investors. Investors must make their own determination either alone or in consultation with their own financial advisors as to the suitability or appropriateness of such investments. ABRA interest accounts are issued by Prime Trust and Nevada Chartered Trust Company. Rates for ABRA interest accounts are subject to change. Digital currencies are not legal tender, are not backed by any government, and ABRA interest accounts are not subject to FDIC or SIPC insurance protections. We've got a lot to talk about today, so let's get to it. Uh, We've got people, as usual, joining from all over the world. Uh, I'm excited to get to your questions. Uh, anything's uh, fair game. Uh, we've got a contest winner as well. We're going to talk about uh, altcoins in the fourth part of our kind of back to basics series. And there's links in uh, the newsletter, I believe, to all of the previous episodes. But you could just go back to uh, YouTube and, and and look at the videos there. Uh, we're streaming on Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, Twitter, even Instagram. So. It's pretty cool. Our audience has been growing. Thank you for that. We really appreciate the support. Uh, so first things first, uh, crazy, crazy uh, Bitcoin times. So uh, as I'm uh, talking here, we're, we're pushing kind of uh, 15,000, uh, uh, 500-ish on, um, on Bitcoin. So uh, that's been a pretty interesting, interesting phenomenon to see this week. And um, you know, we're literally up over 45% uh, in the last 30 days. I've made this point to you, uh, to you all many, many times. Uh, first of all, nothing goes straight up, right? But on the other hand, I am super excited about Bitcoin. Uh, this week's price movement doesn't change that one bit. This is just the beginning. And again, my opinion, I don't give investment advice. Uh, but, but since I wrote my original kind of bullish uh, expose on Bitcoin a couple of weeks ago. Uh, We've seen a breakout of over 10% in November already. Uh, The technicals have never been as bullish as they are now. Bitcoin stock to flow plus the current monthly chart for Bitcoin are all showing a a likelihood of a massive run up in the price of Bitcoin over the next few months. Um, The fundamentals, again, the, the thing about fundamentals is they don't change. So every time I say the fundamentals are going to be the same as the last time, there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. There will be there will never be less fiat printed than there is now. It will only get worse. Cash is becoming more worthless by the day. Another way to look at this run up in the Bitcoin price is it's basically a a devaluation of the dollar because we keep printing more of it. Gold is good, but Bitcoin is great. Those are the fundamentals, plain and simple. Then we talk about sentiment. Consumer sentiment around Bitcoin is basically non-existent. That's amazing given how much the price is going up. Everyone's paying attention to the US election, the pandemic, the stock market, all important things to pay attention to. But in the meantime, institutional investors are paying attention to Bitcoin and driving up the price. When retail investors start getting on the Bitcoin bandwagon, just watch out. There's simply no short-term ceiling that I see on Bitcoin's price. Now, again, nothing goes straight up. Nothing goes straight down. I don't give investment advice. I'm here to help you get educated, do your own homework, and make your own smart investment decisions for yourself. Okay? This is about empowerment. Bitcoin is a movement about democratizing access to money, payments, banking, investing, financial services, and for you to make your own decisions. All right. So let me explain to you my, you may be wondering, how does, how does Bitcoin or the, how did the election affect the price of Bitcoin? Well, let me explain to you my greater Bitcoin election theory. The greater Bitcoin election theory explains how Bitcoin's future is influenced by political elections, such as the one going on in the United States right now. Okay. 
everybody would like to know is the Bitcoin price affected by the elections. So my theory is complex, but I'll boil it down for you in simple terms. Are you ready? Here we go. It just doesn't matter. That's it. You got it? I'll repeat it for you. It just doesn't matter. That's the whole theory. Bitcoin doesn't care who's president. It doesn't care if the Supreme Court is stacked right or left. It doesn't care if government initiates quantitative easing one, two, three, or infinity. Bitcoin doesn't know anything about anything except Bitcoin. That's it. So again, let me repeat. The greater Bitcoin election theory, it just doesn't matter. Bitcoin is going to do whatever Bitcoin is going to do, regardless of who we elect president, how many votes they get, whether they print more money at a faster rate or a slower rate, it doesn't matter. So let's remind ourselves, there's never going to be more than 21 million Bitcoin. Bitcoin is divisible by eight decimal places into units called Satoshis. There will never be more than two quadrillion, 100 trillion Satoshis. It's a tough one to remember. It doesn't matter. Today, a Satoshi is worth 0 0.00016 pennies, US pennies. If Bitcoin goes to 1 million, then one Satoshi will be worth about one penny. Pretty cool. When one Satoshi is finally worth one penny, then I believe we'll start to see people spending Bitcoin via payment services like Lightning Channels on everyday purchases, as well as big ticket items like cars and houses. And Bitcoin will probably be the least volatile hard asset in the world. Everything else will have collapsed. At that point, we'll start seeing governments hoard Bitcoin as well. I think we'll actually start to see it sooner than that, but certainly we'll see it in mass. If you invest $10,000 into Bitcoin today and Bitcoin goes to a million dollars, which I believe it will, again, I keep saying this, but it's not investment advice, it's just my opinion, your 10K investment will be worth 640K. So again, the greater Bitcoin election theory reminds us Bitcoin is going to do what Bitcoin is going to do regardless of what anyone else or any other government does. This includes following a fairly predictable pattern of Bitcoin being hoarded, given its deflationary traits. What do I mean by that? I keep referring to this idea of hoarding Bitcoin. You've probably heard me talk about this many, many times. Hoarding Bitcoin means that no one would want to spend it or sell it, right? Because it's basically in this kind of initial uh, inflationary state leading to deflation. In initial inflationary state means there's still some being created, but it's being created at a slower rate and eventually none will be created, which is why we refer to it as deflationary. So Bitcoin is clearly being hoarded today. What does this mean? Well, the volume of sellers has been muted for months, if not longer. So Bitcoin's price is basically driven by institutional and retail or consumer buyer interest. There's this Austrian theory of money, which I linked to in this week's newsletter, which espouses hard money such as gold or silver is the best money, states that any truly scarce asset will be hoarded until its value reaches such high levels that the original holders have no choice but to use it for spend or barter. That's what happened with gold hundreds of years ago. It's just it's been replaced uh, via guns and courts with government printed money. So in other words, if you believe the purchasing power of your money will go up, you're going to hoard it if you, if, you can, if you can afford to do so. If you believe it will go down or stay flat in value, you're more likely to spend it. Bitcoin is playing out this idea perfectly. It's actually astounding that the Austrian economics rulebook was written almost over 100 years ago, right? Well before my greater Bitcoin election theory. But there you have it. So again, to recap, Greater Bitcoin election theory goes like this. It just doesn't matter. Bitcoin just is, and that is enough. All right. So there's my rant. Uh, sorry for that. But hopefully, uh, if people ask you how is uh, Bitcoin being affected by uh, the election, you can explain to them it just doesn't matter. And you can explain why. Okay. So let's see. What else do we have going on today? We've got a bunch of stuff going on. Um, I'm going to talk about altcoins in a few minutes. 
Uh, we have a bunch of questions related to both altcoins as well as um, Abra in general. Uh, we've got our trusty uh, Abra demo uh, ready here to go. So we'll also take a look at that. By the way, we got a lot of positive comments on our DeFi uh, talk from last week. If you go to the YouTube page, uh, look down. Last week's talk has a whole bunch of commentary about DeFi, what DeFi is, where it's going. And, um, you know, thank you uh, as well to the folks at Pantera for helping to prepare that. And um, you can go watch that at the link below. So let's talk for a few minutes about DeFi. And then I want to get to some of your questions related to, uh, related to DeFi. Okay. So uh, sorry, my, my bad here. All right. So, so why am I... Uh, why am I so, actually, I think I said I was going to get to DeFi. I actually meant get to altcoins. Apologies. So we do this on the fly here, right? So uh, sometimes I speak too fast, but we're going to talk about altcoins today. Sorry for that, not, uh, not DeFi. All right. So why are altcoins so important? Why do they matter? Now, anyone who knows me knows that I'll talk about Bitcoin, my, my greater Bitcoin election theory, Austrian economics, finance and anything in between for hours on end. But what about altcoins? Why are so many people so excited about other cryptocurrencies that aren't Bitcoin or Ethereum? And why are so many um, Bitcoin supporters so negative on altcoins? So let's talk about all of these things. So in the simplest terms, the way I define it, alt altcoins basically include any cryptocurrency tokens that are not Bitcoin and not Ethereum. Altcoins are important because they provide competition to the technology and network of Bitcoin and Ethereum. They also do other things, but that's the way I look at it in simplest terms. The bigger Bitcoin and Ethereum get, the less likely they are to change or adapt to new technologies or even scale to more users. The best solution to any potentially outdated business is competition. That's always been true. Now, to be clear, Bitcoin is not outdated, but given its massive and growing size, it is going to be much slower to adopt new technologies in the future and its scalability to meet on-chain demand is severely limited. The reason I'm okay with that is because there are lots of competitors to Bitcoin. Even if I don't own them or use them, and even if I don't believe they'll survive, they are very important. Litecoin, for example, is kind of like digital silver to me. Right? What do I mean by that? Well, it has faster block propagation, which, which in English means it has, well, not really English, but has larger blocks, which is also a technology concept. But that means it can process more transactions than Bitcoin in the same time frame. In other words, you're, if a lot of people are using it at the same time, you're less likely to wait on a Litecoin transaction than you are in a Bitcoin transaction. But because of network effects, which have given Bitcoin the lead in terms of users and miners, it's not nearly as secure as Bitcoin. Bitcoin Cash is also a fork of Bitcoin, right? Um, and it attempts to address Bitcoin's scalability limitations with, with much larger block sizes. Now, many believe that uh, block size is indirectly proportional to security. While Satoshi didn't necessarily agree with this in his writings, uh, many Bitcoin Core developers believe this. And this is one of the reasons why I believe Bitcoin um, will be slower to adapt. And also, again, why I'm not too worried about that today. Ask me in five years how I feel about that. Um, and I, I may have a different answer, but today I'm okay with Bitcoin taking it slow. I'm also a little concerned about some of the technology complexity being introduced to Bitcoin, which is somewhat at odds with what I'm saying here, but simpler is usually better, okay? All right, so fungibility and privacy are another problem for Bitcoin. Fungibility, let me explain what that means. Fungibility means that it's impossible to distinguish one Bitcoin from another or any other coin from another. Meaning if I send one Bitcoin to you and you send it to someone else and you receive another Bitcoin from someone else and you send that to the same person, the recipient shouldn't be able to distinguish between those Bitcoin. That's not true today. Privacy, on the other hand, generally means I have no way of tracing the source or destination of my cryptocurrency transaction as an outside viewer. Now, neither of these concepts is easily achieved with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin's lack of privacy and, la and lack of fungibility is what makes transactions easily traceable by the government. 
So if you saw the news this week that the government recently seized, I think it was like a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin used back in the days of Silk Road many, many years ago, this makes the point. Okay, So we're talking about Bitcoin that's probably over five years since it's been moved, yet the government was easily able to trace it and, and easily I should let me let me remove the word easily. The government was able to trace it. Whether it was easy or hard doesn't matter. Okay. Altcoins such as Monero and Zcash attempt to solve these privacy problems with competing um, technological approaches. As a result, users who demand that their transactions be private have actually gravitated towards using those currencies over Bitcoin. And I, again, competition wins. Other altcoins, such as Cardano, Tezos, Stellar, offer completely competing views of the future of decentralization versus Ethereum as a core component of internet and computing technology. Right? When I was a kid growing up, it was about client-server. Then it became multi-tier or N-tier web technologies. Now we're moving towards full decentralization, but decentralization comes at a massive cost. Most applications don't require internet scale decentralization and probably shouldn't use it because it's so expensive. Blockchains are very expensive. They're inefficient. They try to solve decentralization. They don't try to solve efficiency. But again, competing views of the world is exactly what the world needs to move forward. Just like human evolution or, or animal evolution happens by competition. It's the same with technology. Abra has written an intro guide, by the way, covering Many of these crypto projects, let me show it to you really quick. Um, I, I linked to it in this week's newsletter. Let me, uh, this is really cool. So if you're interested in altcoins, you should really check this out. Um, let me bring up the browser. Okay, so we've got a, on the left here, um, and again, the link is, the URL is, um, what is it? It's abra.com slash cryptocurrency, and that's it, right? And so uh, you can click on any of them. I'll just go to uh, Cardano. Um, one of the projects I'm particularly bullish on, great, great, great team, Charles Hoskins and the development team have done amazing things there. Uh, you can read about why uh, scalability, interoperability, smart contracts, and, um, you know, and, and, their, and their own uh, organization, as a matter of fact. Uh, we cover other uh, technologies, Monero, which I've always been bullish on, uh, as uh, you know, XMR, also supported in Abra as you know, one of the, the, the first coins to really truly make privacy work. Um, and um, you know, they have a very large uh, development community. We uh, get into a little bit about how uh, the technology works, how these ring signatures uh, work, which is pretty cool tech even now. Uh, and it's been a few years. Uh, and there's others we talk about, uh, Litecoin, um, Status, Stellar, of course. I'm super bullish on the future of Stellar. I think that as central bank digital currencies become a big deal, as we start to use CBDCs and interoperate with the rest of the world, I think Stellar and Stellar Network uh, has a very interesting potential uh, role to play. Okay, So to summarize, the way I look at it, right, altcoins are ultimately uh, about technology. Right, Some of them may die. Some of the technology may, may ultimately never find viable applications. Some of it may find its way to Bitcoin or Ethereum or vice versa, right? Litecoin is interesting because it tends to adopt technologies before Bitcoin. So in some ways it's a test bed for what Bitcoin might do in the future. Again, all essential for moving this entire kind of decentralization movement forward. And we all profit by that at the end of the day. That is a check on Governments run amok. It is a check on government printing out of control. And it's ultimately about freedom and democratization of services. Okay. All right. Let me get to some of your questions and um, keep them coming. We've got plenty of time for uh, questions here. So, uh, and we also have a contest winner, by the way. So we, we won't forget about that. Um, I'm going to make you wait just a little bit on that one. Let me try to pick some altcoins. We've got some Abra specific questions. We've got some altcoin generic questions. Let me try to do some altcoin and also take a couple of DeFi questions from last week if there's any laggards there. Um, Justin B asks, what do I look for in a solid altcoin? Obviously altcoins have various uses, store value, usage tokens, et cetera. But for the average person getting into crypto, 
what would you suggest consumers look for before investing and using? Okay, this is a complicated question. Let me start off by reminding you, and I'm sorry if I keep repeating this, I don't give investment advice. I'm just going to give you my perspective on how I look at crypto um, and how I make decisions about what I'm interested in. First of all, I'm a technologist at heart. My degree is computer science. I was a cryptographer at the CIA. I developed uh, a software before getting into payments and management. Uh, and, and so I love tech. Okay. I'm all about tech. So I read the white papers. When, when we had this ICO craze a few years ago, I was the nut that went through and read all these white papers that no one else was reading because I was really interested in the technology. Right. And I, I learned about, for example, directed acyllic graphs. And I would say to people, hey, you bought that coin? Cool. What do you think about their directed acyllic graph technology? And people would look at me like I have three heads. My point is, is that ultimately, when you think about altcoins, you need to think first and foremost about the technology and the problem that they're trying to solve, whether it's consumer facing, business facing, platform facing, or all, some combination of all three. From an investment perspective, what's the problem? No different than any kind of venture capital investing in a startup, for example, where they ask, what problem are you trying to solve? Who is it for? How big is the problem? How are you going to bring it to market? Now, in the case of decentralized services, it's a much harder thing to, to deal with because in theory, there's no central off switch and there should really not be a central company with a central off switch. That's not really the case with most altcoin projects today because they're not truly decentralized out of the gate. That's a legal issue, which we're not going to cover here. But what I look for is interesting technology, strongly differentiated from the incumbents, particularly Bitcoin and Ethereum, solving named problems. Now, named problems could be anything from scalability, myriad types of smart contracts, ease of implementation in smart contracts, for example, solving problems inherent in Ethereum, right? Chainlink, for example, helps to try to solve the um, what do you call the, the Oracle problem, which we've talked about many times on Money Talks, the Oracle problem being, how do I integrate real world data into smart contracts that have no concept of the physical world? In other words, if my smart contract is dependent upon the price of gold, how do I get the price of gold into my smart contract? Right. So that's a chain link is an example of, of a project that, that, that attempts to, uh, solve that problem. All right. So, um, other ways to look at this are not, not just market cap. There's also technical trading. I, I, I would be lying if I said I never did that when it came to altcoins. Trading altcoins on technical indicators is a big risky business. If you want to do it with small amounts of money, it's like going to the gambling table. Okay. Uh, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I go to Vegas every five years and Put 100 bucks on the blackjack table. That's kind of my limit. I'm not, I'm not a big gambler. I know too much about the math to be, to be interested in it. But, but, but I do get the, I get the rush, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the rush of, of, of gambling. And so I think with small amounts of money uh, and, and being smart and, and, and recognizing that, you know, you, you run the risk of losing all of that money, I think it's okay. On the other hand, if there's projects that you really support and passionately believe in and think have a chance to change the world, that's an, that's an investment and a bet on the future. Usually those are outsized bets that have outsized returns. So if you strongly believe in that and you want to put a small amount of money to work, it's okay because if you lose all that money, it should also be okay. But if the investment goes up 100x, that's an outsized return relative to the outsized risk you're taking on that small amount of money. That's how I look at altcoin investing. It's also how I look at startup investing. Okay, so uh, long answer to a very simple question. When it comes to price correlation, which is closer to altcoins? Is it Bitcoin or is it Ethereum? And then further, do you have plans to run your own nodes to support staking of some altcoins under proof of stake algorithms? Um, we'll come back to that question in a second. Let me talk about price correlation. So um, price correlation is an interesting concept. Let me explain what, that, uh, what, what I think the question means. All right. So the, I think the question basically means uh, are altcoins like uh, Cardano, Digibyte moving more in tandem with the price of Ethereum or more in tandem with the price of Bitcoin? So a lot of times we, we maybe you've heard of this, 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 this phrase, the, an altcoin season. Altcoin season basically refers to this, this, this uh, point in time 
where altcoins as a as a, a broad kind of uh, macro uh, movement are moving in tandem in price up and to the right. Generally, generally, they tend to move with Ethereum and they tend to move in lockstep. I don't think that Ethereum is a leading indicator. Uh, I think Bitcoin is probably the biggest leading indicator for the macros of crypto today. I think that's going to change. I think it's going to change because as more and more institutions and governments start to see Bitcoin as a reserve currency, it will start to become uncorrelated with the use cases of many altcoins and Ethereum, which are more about smart contracts, with, with a couple of exceptions. Excuse me. I think the biggest ex exception is stable coins. I think there's a halo effect for interest in stable coins around uh, buying uh, Bitcoin. And what I mean by that is, is that people who use ex uh, services via Tether, uh, USDT, USDC, uh, DAI, for example, all supported by Abra, you start to see spikes in the level of Ethereum usage, specifically as it relates to those altcoins, when people want to buy Bitcoin. That will often drive up the price of Ethereum because you have to use gas for those transactions and people are competing right, to, to be able to process their transactions on Ethereum. We saw this happen when the DeFi craze hit in August and Ethereum price skyrocketed. The Ethereum network was saturated. It was a disaster and again, made the case for Ethereum 2.0. So the, you will see a bit of a halo effect for stable coins. Again, over time, I think the halo effect is going to be what are the applications of smart contracts in the Ethereum, Cardano, um, you know, and competing technologies like Stellar in that world? What are the competing technologies of smart contracts that can move the entire altcoin space forward? That's one example. The second example is if, if altcoins gain a foothold in payments, Bitcoin is not great for payments today for two reasons. It doesn't scale well yet until we have the second layer tech like Lightning commercially ready. Two, the fees can be very, very high, right? We saw fees last week of up to $15 per transaction. That's more than a Western Union would charge to send money between the US and Mexico. So obviously that's not a good payment solution. And domestically, most payment services are free now. You have Zelle and Venmo and PayPal in the US and competing services in every country in the world. So effectively you're competing with free. So if we're gonna use altcoins for payments, we're going to need those payment, those altcoins to be pervasive, easy to use on and off rails. Nobody's going to use an altcoin for payments if it's harder to use the Digibyte unless, unless it solves a very tangible problem, such as privacy, security, right? potentially cost. Those are real problems to some people, not all people. Right? Obviously, there's people who publish their Venmo transaction to the whole world to see. Right? If you go into your Venmo app on your phone, you can literally see, oh, I just sent Sally $10 for, for our pizza lunch. I don't know why anybody wants to see that I just paid Sally $10, but people do it. So obviously those people for those transactions aren't too concerned about privacy. They probably should be, but they're not. Right? Okay, so that's how I think about price correlation. Um, in terms of the question about staking, we have a bunch of questions about staking here. So let me try to address that now. So as a reminder, right, we have this Abra interest account product. Uh, we support Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum. We also added uh, Lumens. So I have to update this uh, graph here. Sorry for that. So uh, we also have a promotion running for Lumens. If you go to the Abra Twitter account, you can uh, get in on the promotion and win a whole bunch of free uh, Stellar Lumens. Uh, that's pretty cool. So welcome Stellar to the interest account family. We don't yet support uh, staking uh, as part of the interest account family. We are trying to figure out how to bring it to you quickly, uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we don't uh, custody coins ourselves, to be clear. So we work with uh, third-party partners who uh, uh, basically provide custody and trading services and help us manage the interest-bearing accounts as well as our trading accounts. And they're actually different custodians. The complexity of all of that is hidden from, from you, which is good. Uh, but adding new features like staking take a little bit extra time because Abra is not in control of the custody services ourselves. And that's actually an added layer of, of protection for all of you that we can't actually lose your money. All right. So, so we do want to do staking. Um, we're thinking about it. We're working on it. 
as soon as we have something to announce there, I promise we'll, we'll get it to you as quickly as possible. Nothing to announce yet, except to promise you that it's something that I want to do, I would use myself. Uh, and that's often, uh, you know, an interesting driver. <laughs> okay. So um, another question about altcoins here. My concern, and this is from Inno Jr., and then we'll get to our contest winner. Uh, actually, um, let's see here. Uh, actually, let's take this one from John first. A lot of altcoins have died from ICO, IEO, and already happening with DeFi trends. Suggestion on how to weed out bad projects from rare, legit new coins tokens. So, so John, again, I have to liken this. I'm going to compare your question to trading in uh, startups. Right? You can go to sites like AngelList if you're accredited, if you're an accredited investor in the U.S. or um, Bank to the Future in outside the U.S. and invest in startups. Uh, if you're a non-U.S. investor, for example. And you can put your own money directly in startups, just like venture capitalists do now or angel investors. Now, let's talk about the math of that for a second. One, most startups die. Ninety plus percent of startups that are created this year will not be here 10 years from now or even five years from now, for that matter. OK, so a unicorn, which we refer to in Silicon Valley as a startup that's reached a billion dollar market cap is literally one in 250 startups, if not, if not worse. Okay. So your chances of making it as a startup are very, very small. Why is angel investing so profitable? Angel, good angel investors know how to identify certain traits, but they also know how to divest across multiple startups. No angel investor does two investments a year. Some of them are doing 50 to hundred, knowing that if, three or four make it, or even you know, maybe five or six make it, and the rest die, and they get one unicorn, it more than pays for the fund. That's kind of the hidden secret of angel investing. So if you're going to invest in early token projects, and you're investing in just one or two, and you don't know what you're doing, and don't know why the tech is so interesting, your chances of losing your money are very, very high. But again, your chances of losing money at the roulette table are also very high. So if that's all you're doing and you just want to speculate a small amount of money and you don't mind losing it, that's fine. But if your goal is to make money, right, in altcoin investing, you have to go deep and wide. You have to understand which companies have a chance of making it or which projects, I should say, have a chance of making it. And you probably need to spread your investments around across multiple altcoin projects because no one can predict which projects are going to be around? The, the best tech does not always win. The classic example in Silicon Valley is if you're old enough to remember VHS cassettes, right, which was the old video cassettes, obviously that was not the best tech. There was three or four competing technologies such as Betamax, which were significantly better than VHS. Didn't matter, right? A lot of people in the altcoin space that their tech is significantly better in Bitcoin. May not matter. So it's not just about excuse me, not just about the better technology. Okay, so you have to do your homework. You probably have to spread, excuse me, you probably have to spread your money around and be ready for some of those bets to go to zero and some to skyrocket. You wanna let, you wanna ride your winners. If you're doing venture style investing via tokens in the altcoin space, you have to ride your winners. Now, these are not securities. We are not in the securities investing business. That further complicates this, okay? Investing in startups is securities investing. You can look at company financials, you can look at returns, you can look at revenue. In altcoins, you can't do that. The value for the tokens that Abra lists is not derived from the fundamentals of a company because these are not securities. So it's yet a further complication of the investing. So again, this is not for the faint of heart. The returns can be phenomenal, but you have to do your homework. Or you have to be prepared to speculate on a small amount of money, which you can lose. Okay. All right. Um, cool questions. Uh, fun topic. Let's see. Uh, let me get to the winner. All right. We have a contest winner. And uh, let's see. So the winner is Inno Jr. His uh, uh, Twitter handle is at P-O-S-I-T-I-V-8-T-Y. Uh, I'll pronounce that as positive, positive 80. <laughs> Uh, he says, my concern uh, is as most investors only care about immediate benefits rather than the real value of a certain altcoin in the long term, 
how how can you convince users to invest on altcoin in the long term that's a fantastic question so you know it really is more or less what i just said right this come even though these are not securities they're they're projects that basically espouse the tenets of decentralization i think a lot of the way you would you would look at where to put your money as an angel investor is similar even though you're not investing in securities you're investing in a in a commodity effectively but what is the value of that commodity to consumers or businesses over time not just tomorrow if you're a technical speculator and you're looking at charts again i have no problem with that every once in a while i do that not very often i don't have a lot of time for that but it's very risky if you're doing it with small amounts of money it's kind of like going to vegas and if you set a budget for yourself i'm going to I'm going to lose no more than $50 at the blackjack table and if I go home with 500, it was a great night. But if I go home with 0, it's also okay because it was $50 and I had fun. Right? That's the short-term two-week speculator. If you want to make long-term returns on these altcoins, you have to do your homework. Spend time uh, on the Abra site that I just showed you, right? Uh, and looking at how these different currencies work, what they do, Right, what they're good for, what their long-term prospects are, right? Or don't do it. That's my advice. Okay. Now, I'm telling you this, knowing that the more transactions you do on Abra with all coins, the better off it is for Abra. But it's not good for any of us if I tell you to go put all your money on all coins. I don't want you to do that even though it would actually be in the short term financially better for Abra. Don't do it. That's what I'm telling you. Okay? Be smart. Look at different projects. If you're if you want to treat this like angel investing even though they're commodities, make lots of long-term bets of small amounts and ride the winners and write off the losers. If you want to treat it like a roulette table, use very small amounts of money. That's the best way to look at all coins. You know, we're going to get in touch with you on Twitter to get your winnings. Uh, thanks for uh, everyone for participating uh, in our uh, contest. Please help us promote Money Talks. We put a fair amount of work in preparation for this show, uh, not only the, the video production uh, and, and dealing with all social media, but the content and everything else that goes into it. So the more retweets we get, the, uh, the more follows and subscriptions we get on YouTube. So you see that subscribe button on YouTube, press it now. The more of those we get, uh, the more clear it is from us to us that you want us to continue doing this and the higher Google and others will, will promote us versus other uh, searches uh, for things like Bitcoin and other things on, on YouTube and Twitter. Okay. So thanks for the support there. Congrats. Inno. let's see what other questions do we have here? Um, as we enter the crypto bull run, can altcoins outperform Bitcoin in terms of market cap? So we have this uh, concept um, in Bitcoin of, um, you know, I forget the phrase right now, but which in terms of like which um, where is Bitcoin versus it's a dominance factor. That's the phrase I was looking for. Where is Bitcoin's dominance in terms of market cap versus other cryptocurrencies in the whole? Because Bitcoin is so huge, its, it's market cap is like way bigger than all the other coins combined. Bitcoin's dominance factor has actually been increasing. The last few weeks, which means Bitcoin is increasing in value at a faster rate. Than, than the combination of all the other altcoins. That's happened many times in the past. When we get into these altcoin seasons that I mentioned before, Bitcoin's dominance often goes down. And that's an indication that we actually are entering into an altcoin season, meaning Bitcoin's value stays relatively flat and altcoins are going up at a faster rate. That's happened a few times over the last few years. Again, uh, please go back to my earlier comments of the last few minutes on how I look at altcoins. Right now, you should make up your own minds. Many of you have probably have very different opinions on how to look at altcoins, but that's how I look at it. And so I don't really look at it in terms of altcoins outperforming Bitcoin. I look at it using the guides that I that I just gave you. Um, let's see. Uh, G10 asks, uh, by the way, that was from Richard. Thank you, Richard, for that question about uh, altcoins. Um, G10 asks, what do I think will be the most determining factor uh, in the public choosing a coin for payments and begin the transition transition to crypto. I actually think that the biggest factor is going to be who controls the eyeballs. 
let me explain what I mean by that. Earlier uh, last year, or or earlier this year, I guess now it's it's what a crazy year, right? So so uh, you remember Facebook announced this project called Libra. Now Libra, when they announced it, wasn't even real. There was I think there was a white paper. I think there may have been some prototype tech, but the project wasn't real. It wasn't prime time. There was nothing available, right? And developers that looked at the the prototype tech couldn't even get it to compile. So there was really nothing there. Why did everybody lose their minds about Facebook announcing this new nonprofit association for crypto when there was really nothing there? Well, the answer is simple. They have over a billion users across their properties, uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Instagram. In the aggregate, I think they have like 2 billion users. Now, if Abra did that, even though we have you know, m over a million users, uh, or if even if Coinbase did it, it wouldn't get the international government-based press. It caused Donald Trump to comment on Bitcoin. Okay? There's no cryptocurrency that, company that's going to make an announcement that's going to get the president to opine on Bitcoin. Okay? Libra did that because they know the power of Facebook. So Facebook could release the crappiest technology for crypto ever created if it has a nice user experience and solves a real world problem, it is going to get adoption. And I would say there are some real world problems in, face, in, in, in payments that are probably solvable by some of these social media oriented companies, such as cross-border payments. Person to person payments are still very expensive. If you use Western Union or Zoom on PayPal, <clears throat> you're often paying you know, up to 10% of the money depending upon which two countries you're transacting it. And, and this is, by the way, my old company, Boom Financial, which is now part of a wireless carrier that actually did, did that service. We provided these money transfer, cross-border money transfer remittance services. So I know this world really well. It's really expensive. And part of the, the, the goal of Boom was to drive those prices down. And that's what led me to, 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 to Bitcoin ultimately, by the way, right? Was, was how powerful the Bitcoin tech could be at scale eventually to drive these prices down. But the biggest advantage of Facebook, to get back to your question in solving that problem, is their existing user base. That's what's ultimately going to drive massive user of adoption. So when Square, for example, first got into person-to-person uh, -person payments, I, I don't think anybody at Square knew anything about Bitcoin, right? They were very effective with their dongle at enabling small businesses to accept credit cards. They leveraged that to basically create a massive user base to get Square Cash into person-to-person uh, -person payments and then segue that into crypto with a much larger user base. That's what it's going to take to get mass market adoption of crypto. Now, what Abra is doing is also going to make a big dent, right? Now, as a startup, our revenue is, is, is fine. Our user base is, is great. Our assets under management are great, but that's relative to a startup. That makes our investors happy. It makes me happy. It makes our employees happy and it makes our user base happy, but it's still small compared to Facebook and Twitter and, and a lot of these social media or Apple, Google. One of those companies is going to get big into a payments product that leverages crypto in the next five years. I'll put my entire reputation on it. It's going to happen. And that is going to propel the entire space forward. Okay. Now, Abra will get a halo effect on that because we're solving a lot of problems they don't solve, like our interest accounts, the ability to trade across 100 plus currencies, the fact that it's global, the fact that we have payment rails in and out running in lots of countries. So there's always going to be problems that we will solve that they can't. And that's awesome. That's the nature of competition that I talked about earlier. Okay, But that's what it's going to take to get us there. JP asks, could, could it be possible that any altcoin could take down Bitcoin? Um, anything's possible. I mean, look at 2020. If, if 2020 proves anything, it is that anything is possible, right? I think the, um, uh, the likelihood of something taking down Bitcoin in the crypto space is very low. And, and, and the biggest reason for that is what I call the network effect. Uh, and that is, you know, you, you base, it's a combination of, um, Moore's law on the computing side with um, Metcalf's law on the network side. Metcalf's law is this idea of the value of a network. It says if, if you add another node to the network, its value goes up geometrically 
for each node as opposed to linearly. And of course, Moore's law says that the, uh, the, the number or the, val or the computing power uh, of, of a computing system should uh, double in cost and, and, and have in, 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 in price uh, every uh, two years, I believe, or every two, two and a half to three, two to two to three years, let's say. When you combine those, that's why we have phones like this that are more powerful than the supercomputers I worked on at NASA 25 years ago, right? And are gonna be even smaller and more powerful and enable virtual reality in real time with ocular implants in the next 10 years, okay? Which again, it, it's, that's all common sense if you actually follow the tech through and, and, and Moore's law and, and, and Metcalf's law. And, and, and that's also why I think Bitcoin is going to win. The only uh, way Bitcoin could lose at this point would be a catastrophic technology failure of the system, which could either be via quantum computing or encryption issues. Very unlikely. I mean, astronomically unlikely in my humble opinion, but black swan events do happen. Great business book, by the way. If you have never read Black Swan, please read it, but unlikely to happen in this case, in my opinion. Again, it's just one person's opinion. Doug asks, what are my thoughts on Bitcoin being seized by the US authorities when it comes to Bitcoin wallet that's linked to the Silk Road. If the government tells you to delist Monero XMR due to it not being able to be transparent, where would Abra stand? Well, those are good questions. So, okay, so let me take the Bitcoin uh, Silk Road question first. I talked about this during my opening comments that Bitcoin is not a privacy token insofar that uh, the sources and sinks of, of transactions, meaning the, the origin and the destination are totally transparent. Um, even if you use Tor, I have some concerns. Tor is privacy technology that you can put in a web browser to mask your transaction. Even if you use Tor, I have some concerns that, that, that you know, prying eyes can figure out uh, who you are and where you're sending transactions to. So governments like Bitcoin. Why? They like Bitcoin because they can see everything you're doing. You do your job for them in terms of being totally transparent about your life. Now, I'm not opining if that's good or bad. It just is. I love Bitcoin. I'm all in on Bitcoin from an investment perspective and as a hard asset, uh, which I've talked about many times. But in terms of payment transactions, right, there are better technologies than Bitcoin today. I don't think any core developer even would, would, would uh, dispute that. Monero being one, Zcash being another, and there are others. Okay. Now, if the government said, delist this. Now, what does that actually mean? Right. I've talked about this. I've said that I don't think that the government can shut down Bitcoin ever because of privacy issues. Not, not privacy, sorry, because of what we, in the U.S. I'm talking about now, because of what we call First Amendment rights issues. I believe that the U.S. Supreme Court has already opined, right, that software is protected free speech. Your ability to store ones and zeros, that's all uh, uh, cryptocurrency is. It's a, a stream of ones and zeros, just like storing a music file or a word file. That is protected free speech in the United States. So, so a government ordering a software company to not allow people to store ones and zeros in the cloud, that would be a big problem for Dropbox. It would be a big problem for Google and their cloud services, uh, Apple's cloud services not to mention cryptocurrency wallets. I don't see it happening. Now, obviously a lot of government agencies around the world, not picking on the US government, don't like privacy coins, right? But in the early days, they didn't like SSL, which is the encryption technology that the early internet used before it moved to TLS. They didn't like that technology. Why? Because they couldn't spy on it. Now, a lot of us believed that the NSA could crack SSL if we used short version of the keys. So we went to much longer versions of the keys that we knew that they couldn't crack. And they didn't like that either. But we did because we were perfectly within our free speech rights to do so. There's some exceptions to that. Um, in their infinite wisdom, the government considers certain encryptions technologies to be uh, weapons and has put uh, historically export restrictions on encryption as a weapons grade technology. Uh, I, I believe most of those restrictions no longer exist. And partially because so many co uh, companies outside the US went and did it for us to get around those export restrictions and then the government realized they were fighting a losing battle. Again, competition wins, okay? All right, uh, cool stuff. Um, and and uh, let me, let me um, address this, what would Abra do? Abra would always follow the letter of the law. 
But if the law was, you, know, you can't list software or a, you know a, a certain technology in your product, not securities, right? If the government said that this asset is a security and we're not a licensed uh, broker dealer, for example, we, we couldn't do it because it would be deemed a security unless we got into the securities business as a broker dealer, right? But if it's a commodity and we're not in the, in the derivatives business, right? That's a money transfer e-money issue. It's not a first amendment rights issue. It's not a privacy issue. Meaning if we're allowed to list Bitcoin or Ethereum, we should be allowed to list any other commodity in our app as well. That's my opinion. Okay. All right. Great questions. Um, Linda says, good morning, uh, Bill. Thank you so much. This is my first experience using the Ever wallets. Very cool and secure. Thank you, Linda. We love those comments. It's why we do this. We, we really want to help everybody get into Bitcoin and crypto. Uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's very gratifying. We love it, but uh, keep the uh, questions coming. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded that um, we have the support team here. Uh, they've been online answering a lot of questions. If they don't get to your question and it's, it's specific to your Abra app, you can email them at support at abra.com. That's support at abra.com. And after the show, they'll, they'll answer your question and get back to you uh, right away. Let me take uh, two more questions here. Um, oh, all right. I'm getting some questions and comments about Bitcoins and crypto scams. Let me, let me address this one head on. Uh, how do I avoid uh, cryptocurrency and altcoin scams? I, I probably have six of these questions. So let me, let me talk about this. All right. So the most common scam related to cryptocurrencies is, hey, uh, download Abra, send me two Bitcoin today, and I'll send you back six Bitcoin tomorrow. If someone you don't know asks you to send them Bitcoin outside of the Abra app, one, don't do it ever. Two, go see rule number one. Okay. If you're not sure what to do, send an email immediately to support at Abra.com and we'll help you. But in general, we're going to remind you of rule number one, which is never send Bitcoin to somebody you don't know or any crypto for that matter. It's probably a scam. Abra is a safe place to transact. It's a safe place to invest in cryptocurrencies. It's a safe place to hold and send crypto to people you know. But please don't send cryptocurrencies to people you don't know. You're getting scammed. It's that simple. If you're not sure, again, our support team is happy to help anytime. Go on social media, ask us. Probably better via email, right, uh, to protect yourself. But, but the rule is pretty simple. It happens every week. It's happening less on a percentage basis, people are getting smarter, but it still happens. Please be smart, okay? There is no free lunch is the old saying, right? No one is gonna send you back five Bitcoins tomorrow if you send them one Bitcoin today, no one, okay? Again, be careful. All right, so let's see. Is XRP a stable coin? Uh, XRP is not a stable coin. XRP is another form of cryptocurrency. It is a different technology versus uh, the ones we've been talking about. And we can go back to our list of cryptos here and you'll see that we list XRP also known as Ripple. Uh, and it is a, uh, a different type of cryptocurrency. Uh, it's being used predominantly in interbank transactions. It uses this Ripple protocol um, and they use these, this node architecture called validators. Ironically, or not ironically, but interestingly, uh, the original uh, brains behind uh, XRP slash Ripple is also the person who started the Stellar Foundation. Uh, and there's some interesting overlap and in the technology and in theory, some improvements to uh, Stellar uh, versus, uh, versus Ripple, okay? Uh, we'll talk more about that um, when we have more time in the future. But that is um, that is XRP. Okay, Andre asks, how come some altcoins have been tanking as Bitcoin has been skyrocketing? Uh, will they ever catch up? Some of the reason for this is people doing technical investing in altcoins. What do I mean by that? I mean, they're not doing what I said earlier, which is looking at the merits of the projects. They're just blindly investing based upon the, the, tech, the technical charts. When Bitcoin's dominance goes up, Many people are selling their altcoins to put money in Bitcoin to make a quick dollar there. And that causes a, a, an acceleration in the drop of the altcoin price. 
This has happened a few times in the past. I, I discourage you from investing in altcoins that way because it's a very good way to lose money. I, I encourage people to pick the projects that they think have long-term potential or make very small speculative bets, just like at the roulette table and be prepared to lose a lot of money or, or the money if you're doing that, but you can get huge gains just like you can on occasion at the roulette or blackjack table. If you look at it that way, you'll be fine, right? But don't put all your money on a couple of altcoin projects, a lot of money, and then be shocked if the value goes to zero. Think of it like angel investing in commodities as opposed to angel investing in equities. All right, so uh, thanks again to the Abra team for supporting this. Uh, if you don't have the Abra app, you can get it at abra.com. And uh, you know, great week for Bitcoin, right? So the price is holding pretty steady uh, at about 15,500. We did touch 16,000 yesterday, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I mean, I think we were at 13,500 like three days ago. So November and December are going to be super exciting months. You all know how bullish I am. We'll see. Nothing. This is not going to happen overnight, folks. This is a multi-year. I'm in this for the long term. By, by long term, I mean probably five years at least. I'm going to hold Bitcoin forever, some of it. Uh, but in terms of this investment cycle, I'm looking at a five-year cycle. And I'm, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Bitcoin gets to a million in that five years. No promises, not investment advice. But I think Bitcoin literally has a chance to get to a million dollars. That's what the stock to flow and other charts are telling me and other fundamentals are telling me. I'm going to leave it there. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Um, we'll see by the time we get uh, onto Money Talks next Friday who our next president will be in the United States. Greater Bitcoin election theory doesn't care, but many Americans do. And in the meantime, have a great weekend and we'll see you uh, next time on Money Talks. Be well. Bye bye.